And do you all see a big Windows screen yeah, on Yeah, I see it. Excellent, 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 excellent. Okay, good. So the right screen's showing this time. All right. So losing from there we go. So I had plans of grandeur and everything of going through and prevent, presenting, you know, setting up VNets and VPN connection and Azure Active Directory. And then I realized when I was doing that, I was coming up with a lot of little roadblocks when I set up Azure. And the more you touch Azure, the, the lead, these have less and less impact on your life. However, there's these little things. It's the little things that would always trip me up. So I was like, I thought to um, myself, Dan, we're not seeing the yeah. presentation. Sorry to interrupt. Just want you are to... not. Yeah, can you expand that? Uh, right now, it really small. Can you? Oh, uh, okay. We're, we are on the wrong screen. Then let me switch right. screen. Then. All right. I apologize for that, folks. All right. Screen. Come on. And tell me if you see that now. Um, I see it, but small? it looks like it's the presenter's view. It's really small. All I see are the small slides. Okay. That is interesting. All right. Sorry about that. My, my screen one and screen two got reversed. I apologize, folks. So it is the little things, and you were seeing the little things there just a second ago, my little slide deck. So my name is Daniel Taylor. I've worked at places like Nielsen Media Research, Public Supermarkets, New York Life Direct. Currently, I'm a senior consultant here at Pragmatic Works, getting ready to go on my two-year anniversary here. Um, I've had the pleasure of being a tech editor on the SQL Server 2014 Pro Administration Guide, How Time Flies, seeing that 2016 is out already. A uh, long time ago, we're already in 2017. I Twitter at at DBA Bulldog. A lot of personal stuff there, but technical stuff as well. Sharing out uh, technical ideas and sharing out technical items. My friends share. Uh, my email is detailer at pragmaticworks.com, and I need to add more material here, but I blog at wordpress.dbabulldog.com. So it's the little things, right? So I wear glasses. For those of you who know me, um, that you know I wear glasses, and I wear a pretty thick pair of glasses. And recently they put me in progressive lenses. And I have to look up, I have to look down to see all the little things. So I kind of equated this to wearing glasses, or at least for me it was like wearing glasses. The, the more I look at things and the more I change my head, and the direction I change my head, I see these little things. So what... Today, this session's intended for those who are really starting out with Azure. Um, it's going to be a very relaxed session. This isn't a very high technical level session, probably 100, 200 level session. Um, and what I wanted to share is the little things that have plagued me over time, the things that have really caused me headaches and and made my life some days miserable, right? Uh, when it when it comes to Azure. Not that Azure is miserable, it's just some things, if you don't use it on a regular basis, you forget. So I wanted to just share these little things that have plagued me. Um, during our time together, we're going to talk about connecting to our Azure account. Some of this may be new to you all, some of you may be already using it. We're going to discuss at a very high level the ARM versus the classic deployment method. We're going to talk about wasting cost when we don't shut down a VM, then we're going to take a high-level look at cost and how we can see the cost of our SQL Server, um, our SQL Server, our Azure resources by looking at the uh, the reports Microsoft provides to us within the portal. Also, there's a quick PowerShell demonstration there, and then we're going to look at ways to show the cost within the portal and some metrics. And we're going to talk a little bit about resource limits because there are some within Azure. So the first thing we're going to talk about is connecting to our Azure account. We have two ways, the portal and PowerShell. 
the portal's really easy to use. All you need is a compatible web browser, and there's the list of web browsers that are available to us. Edge, Internet Explorer, Safari, Chrome, Firefox. I use Chrome a lot. Uh, to be honest um, and they always state the latest version just to make sure you have the latest security patches and that all the components that they deploy will will work with when using your utilizing the portal through your web browser then we also have PowerShell and there's some things we need to do we need to have our window power, Windows PowerShell or PowerShell ISE I use the ISE a lot I'm not a PowerShell guru like some folks out there I wish I was um, uh, you know but I use PowerShell our, the PowerShell ISC for some of the commands will run, and I'll show you how to connect through PowerShell. We need to install, install the latest PowerShell uh, commandlets, the, the modules available to connect to Azure, and we'll, we'll test our connection. So the first thing I want to do is let's, let's look at real quick, let's look at connecting to, oops, let's look at connecting to the portal, via the portal. So we're going to open up our, I'm going to use Google Chrome here, and we're going to connect to the portal. So the first thing you do is you go to portalazure.com. Like I said, many of you have already seen this. So I already have my login uh, automatic. You can set your login to sign in automatically. Let's sign out so I can show you real quick. So it's going to show that we're signed out. It's going to take a bit here. Now I'm going to log in through my DanTheDBA at Hotmail.com account. That's the one that I have set up with my MSDN license. It's going to ask for a password, and I'm going to type that in. Now you can see here we're connected to the portal. Like I said, very easy to use. Uh, shows us all of our resources available. You can ping things to your dashboard here so that you can see what items you used. We'll talk a little bit about my credit remaining. Um, that's one of the pet peeves, or not pet peeves, but one of the things that um, we need to keep or pay attention to um, when using Azure as our spend. One of the biggest issues or one of the biggest issues management has with Azure when we start utilizing it within our environment is the spend, and spend can go up quite quickly if we're not controlling what we're doing. So we're going to talk a little bit about that at the end of the session. So we have our Azure, um, or our portal, and we're connected to Azure. We also have VM. So I've already opened oh, VM PowerShell to connect to our Azure resources. I've already opened up my PowerShell ISE. Um, I've switched to my CTemp drive. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to connect up to, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to utilize we're going to install the modules required to access Azure. So um, to show the full install, first thing I'm going to do, I've already got the modules installed. I'm going to uninstall the modules here just to show you. Uh, the Azure RM components that get installed. So that is complete. Now I'm going to do an install of our module Azure RM Verbose. And here you can see it's installing our Azure components, and it's going to ask us, I know this is a trusted site, so I'm going to say yes to all. It's going to take just a quick second, and you can see that the uninstall didn't remove all of the module items, but it allowed me to show what is getting installed from this package. Um, and these the, the link to the Azure RM module required by PowerShell is in the slide deck, so you'll have that so you can connect up to it and choose the deployment model you want with respect to PowerShell. So now that we're connected, or now that we have our module loaded into PowerShell, our next step is to connect to Azure. So we're going to log into our Azure RM account. Now you can do this through an automated process and you could have a PowerShell process behind the scenes, but for the purpose of this demo, we're going to just use the log login Azure RM account. It's going to open up a window and I'm going to put him, I'm going to use the Dan, the DBA at hotmail.com and it's going to ask me for my password.
So now you can see here that we are logged into our Azure account. Now you may have multiple subscriptions and if you run into this issue, you can run this Get Azure RM subscription and we can copy this. You can get Azure, we can run this PowerShell command and we can get the different subscriptions available to us. And here you can see that I have a Visual Studio Premium with MSDN and a Visual Studio Enterprise with MSDN. My Premium, even though it says enabled, I know it's not an active account. So what we need to do real quick is I need to select and I need to get I need to change so that when we run our command a little bit later on, we are using my enterprise edition of my Azure subscription. So we're going to get our Azure RM subscription, and here you can see that we've connected and we have changed to use Visual Studio Enterprise with our with MSDN license. Now, if I wanted to, I could also run, for example, a Git. Azure RM context, and this will show me the context that I'm currently running in for my subscription, and, and truly indeed we are using the Enterprise Edition with MSDN. So that's just real basic how you connect. So you could list your resources, you could show your cost, you could create items within uh, PowerShell. Just wanted to show the basics, what it took for me to understand what I needed to do to connect to PowerShell. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. We'll, we'll show a PowerShell script I found on GitHub. GitHub, oh man, my best friend. So we're going we're gonna to go back to that in a bit. So we're back in our portal, but let's go back to our slide deck here. And so we've talked about connecting through the portal and PowerShell. So we have those two mechanisms that we can con connect and manage our environments. Now we have the ARM versus the classic deployment. And if you're new to um, Azure, you probably won't be utilizing much of the classic deployment model. However, if you've been using Azure for a while, you may still have some of your items in the classic model. In the classic model, deployment model, which was the original deployment model pushed out to us when Azure went live, you had to manage each resource independently. So our IPs, our VNets, our virtual machines, our storage, all those items had to be managed independently. So we had to manually track these resources. We had to know which resources were out there within our environment so that we could properly deploy them. So when we would do an automated deployment, we would need to step through and we need we would need to know the order of operations to successfully deploy, let's say, a VM for SQL Server or a VM for our application server. This also made it very difficult to control our access. Each of our resources needed to be controlled, the access to those resources needed to be controlled independently. Made it very difficult and you could miss things during your deployment or as you, or you could give elevated access to certain indiv individuals that didn't necessarily need that access. It was also very difficult to monitor. Costing was very difficult as we didn't have a good way to monitor what and who was using our resources. Then came along the ARM, the strong ARM. The ARM is awesome. It allows us, it's the resource, it's our resource model. So as the, I'm sorry, the as Azure recent, Wow, Azure is kicking my butt today, the, the speaking of it, I apologize. It's the Azure Resource Manager. As ARM came about, it made it easy for us to deploy, manage, and monitor our services in a group. It allows us for consistent deployments because we know that it's going to apply things in the order that we define them as. We can control access now at a resource level, and we're going to look at this through the portal after we, we discuss this slide real quick. So we can now control all of our resources through a single resource group. It made it much easier so we can at, control access to the IPs, the storage, the VM, the application, all through our resource manager. We could create JSON files to create resource manager templates. So if we're deploying 30, 40, 50 VMs in Azure, we can now create these resource manager templates 
and we can have a consistent deployment time and time again. We know that every deployment is going to be consistent and we can define those dependencies. So if we have post or pre-install tasks, we can define these de dependencies through our resources and they're deployed in order. So let's go, let's go back to our portal now. Okay, so we talked about resource groups. So here on the left side of the screen, we have a blade that we can click on called resource groups. Let's click on that real quick. I have two resource groups here defined. I have environment one and environment two. These are my resource groups. This is the high level, I want to say container. It's basically a container, a resource group that everything's contained in. So if we go to environment one, for example, It'll open up a new blade here, and you'll see we have a bunch of different uh, settings and options that we can look at here. But what, most importantly, what I want to show, let me scroll over, is that within this resource group, we have our storage account, we have our virtual network, we have our virtual machine, we have our network interface, we have our public IP address, and we have our network security group. So you may ask yourself, how easy is it? To set this up so we're going to go over here on the blade and we're going to create a new virtual machine and we can see here we have machine one machine two which are stopped and deallocated which we'll be speaking about here in a bit all right so we're going to go add we're going to click on add it's going to open up a new blade here for the purpose of this demo we're just going to create a new windows server and I'm going to choose Windows Server 2012 R2 uh, data center version just for this example. Now here you're going to see we're going to have an option that we can select our deployment model and we can use classic or resource. For this we're going to use the resource manager. I'm going to hit create and they've made it so easy for us to do this. It's, it's, it's actually fun. Um, so here I know we have machine one and machine two names. So I'm just going to call this machine three. Great naming convention, but you can use a naming convention that fits your environment here. For the disk type, I'm going to stick with SSD. If we know we, if we know we don't need high performing disk, we could choose uh, magnetic, but in this case, I'm just going to use SSDs. This is the username. This username here is not my Azure account that I use to log in. This is the username that is going to have admin access to our VM here within our Azure environment. I'm going to create a secure password. And this is cool. I love this. So it's going to pop up and it's going to tell you what a so, uh, what a strong password is for them. And it can be anywhere from 12 to, and 123 characters long. I can't remember 24. Uh, 123 characters would be fun. Um, so I'm gonna type in the password, a strong password here. It matches. I'm gonna use my enterprise subscription. And here you can see that you can create, you can use a existing resource group or create a new one. So let's click on existing real quick. And you can see here that I have environment one or environment two already available, but I want to create a new environment. So I'm going to create environment three. So I, can, this, I know I want to control this environment. I know I want ease of access. I want to be able to cost this individually. I want to be able to manage access. So I'm going to create an environment three. We're going to click OK. And here we have our pricing. And if I view all, these are going to be all of the family types of Azure VMs available to me with my subscription. You can see here we could go down and we could use up to hmm, 1000 close to $1,150 a month. I am not comfortable with that because I have $150 a month, so I'm going to click on a DS1 V2 standard just for the purposes of this demo. I'm going to hit select. It's going to pop us to our settings screen. 
Now this came about end of last year, this year, and it's managed disks. And if you can use managed disk, I recommend you use that. Uh, I'm planning on, or somebody's, I, I would like to, I'm planning on doing another webinar or at least a blog post on managed disks and the benefits of them. Uh, there's very few drawbacks, but I use managed disk whenever possible. This manages the redundancy. This manages the backups. It allows Azure to handle everything for us, where we would used to, where we used to have to handle all the backups and the redundancy and that associated with our storage account. Azure's handling that for us. I'm going to use the virtual net, default virtual network name. I'm going to use the default subnet IP this and all the other defaults here you could set up a set of IPs for your environment as long as they don't overlap say you join your Azure environment to your domain you could set up a, a subnet here of new IPs so that you could do availability groups or you could connect from one server to another server in Azure um, if you have a hybrid scenario um, we're going to click on this Real quick, we're going to open the public IP blade real quick. Here you can create a static IP or a dynamic IP. Um, we're not going to go into too much detail, but let's say, for example, you had a DNS outside of Azure that could only access an IP. Here you would use a static IP because we're going to look at something here in the next slide, and I'll show you why you may need to use that static IP. But we're going to, use, we're going to close these blades down. So we're not going to talk about a high availability or availability set sets outside of the, the scope here. Um, I probably will be doing another webinar here on um, availability sets. The availability sets deal with default domains and update domains and when servers will be taken offline or patched. Um, and you can control to make sure that your application or your database environment all doesn't go offline at one time. We're going to click OK here. It's going to provide us, it's going to do a final validation, and we're going to click OK. All right, so it's submitting the deployment, and we can see over here, you can see it's deploying my Windows Server in the middle of the screen. If we go look here, you can see now it's already created a resource group. If we click on this resource group real quick, we can see that it's already going through, and it's, it's taken care of its virtual network, its public IP address, it's network security group, and if we wanted to, if we were really interested and uh, we didn't have time to go get coffee or something, we could hit on deploying and we could tell our boss we're really busy and we're watching the state. But it'll show here all the status of your deployment. But we're going to move on. We're going to let that go and cook, um, and we're going to go look at a couple other things real quick. So let's go back to our slide deck real quick. All right, so we talked about Classic and ARM, and we looked at a deployment with ARM. We're going to look at, when we, when we go back to that environment three, I'm going to show you some reasons why I recommend ARM over Classic and what we would need to do if we were using the Classic deployment model. All right, so, oh, all right, let's go back to... RVM. So we have environment one, environment two, environment three. Over here on the left-hand side of the screen, let me highlight this first, we have our virtual machines. We have our classic. If we had any classic machines still deployed to our environment, they would show up here. And then we have our, our virtual machines. So here, if we click on this, we're going to open up our virtual machine blade. So, you can see here machine three is in the process of be, being created. We have machine one and machine two. We have machine one and machine two stopped and deallocated. Let's start these up. All right, so we're starting our virtual machines and it's as easy as that. So what we're gonna talk about here is we're gonna talk about a little bit more about the dynamic versus the static IP. Um, we're going to show some things that happen when we deallocate our servers with respect to a DI, uh, the IP. We're going to add a DNS name so we could have a fully qualified name. We're going to look at expanding storage, and we're going to show how a VM can be resized as well, and we're going to look at some ways to RDP in. And the reason I mention these are is 
due in part that these are the issues I typically have when I'm working with a VM or that I did have in the past when working with a VM. So here we can sh see our machine one is up and running. So we're going to click on it. And here we can, yes, I know I'm running out of memory. Memory. Here we can see that we have an IP, and I've already given a DNS name to this. Let's hit copy on that real quick. We're going to make a note of that here in Notepad because I, I want to show you something, something that's important uh, for, for you to know when, when working with a VM. So the first thing we're going to do with Machine One is we're going to go over here and we're going to look at our network interfaces. We have a network interface machine 1242. We're going to click on it. We're going to go over here to our IP configurations. And this is being recorded, so you can come back to this recording and look at it as well. Now, if I needed to for any given reason, I could come in and I could make this IP static. And in this case, I did make it a static IP. So I needed an IP address, for example, for my uh, named server or my DNS server in my hybrid environment to be able to connect to. I can't have that IP change. And in this case, it just assigned it a 10.0.4. And that's an IP address range that we've defined within our subnet. So we're going to click X out of here. We're going to go back to our virtual machines. We're going to click on machine one again. And you can see all three of my machines are running. So now what we're going to do is we are going to connect. So there's multiple ways you can connect to a machine. So here we can connect either via the portal or we can just start up an RDP session. But first, let's connect through the portal. So we're going to connect through the portal here. It's going to create a little RDP session that you need to open. It's going to ask us, do we, are we sure we want to connect? We're going to say, yes, we're going to connect. It's going to open up my credentials here. And then it's going to say, are we sure we want to do this? And one more time, I'm going to say yes. So now we have opened up. We are on our virtual machine in Azure. So it's opened up a connection to there. So now we can do our work in there. Another way, let's say that you didn't want to open the portal every time and you knew uh, that your, your machine name. So what I want to do is I want to open up a RDP session. Inside this RDP session, so let's pop back over to our portal real quick. Here you can see within our portal, I've defined a DNS name. So we have the IP that has been assigned. Sound effects are free. We have our IP here that's been assigned dynamically, and we have a fully qualified DNS name here. First thing when we I want to point out is when we connect through here, you could see that it is connecting through the IP. However, let's say I didn't want to open up the portal and I knew my machine's name and I knew the fully qualified name. What we can do is we can open up our RDP session Insert the fully qualified name here. The fully qualified name is, and you can see here, machine1.ecuscloudappazure.com. I'm going to show advanced options. Another thing I want to point out here is if you're not joined to domain, a domain name, the domain name is going to be the physical server name. So in this case, it's machine one with the username. If I was connecting to just via RDP, not using the connect in the portal, it would be machine two slash the admin name. Or if in the case of the new machine that we created, it would be machine three slash the admin name. So we're going to hit connect here real quick. And we're going to type in our password. And it's going to connect up. 
into our Azure account. While it is doing that, let me go back over here to our virtual machines, and let's go to machine two. It's up and running now. You can see it's in a running state. You can see over here that my DNS name has not yet been created. So it's labeled as none. We can fix that real quick. We're going to click on this little hyperlink here. We're going to go into our configuration, and here you can see we have a DNS label option. To stay consistent with my other machine, I'm just going to call this machine, machine 2. And now it's going to append this with the ECUS cloud app.azure.com. And this is going to give me a domain name. So we're going to hit tab out of that. And you can see here we got a little check mark that's saying our name is good. We're going to hit save. And now we can go back to machine two. And you can see now that, that we have a fully qualified name. So if we go back over here to, got to type in the right password. All right, so now you can see um, when we log in, we're logging in via the machine one, the fully qualified name. And just to show you that we logged into the same server, I left the other session open and you can see here that I kicked myself out. So it's showing that I'm just, rather than connecting through the portal and using the IP, I'm connecting through just the regular RDP session. And you could use the IP in the RDP session, uh, but I just wanted to show that there's multiple ways to uh, connect. And if you're not part of a domain, some of the, the pains I had there, it took me a little while to figure out that I had to put machine one in front of my login name to be able to connect to those. So we've gone through some of the pain points, right? The IP, the domain name, we've gone through configuring a resource environment. Uh, so let's go back to our server here. All right, now what I wanna do is I'm gonna go over here and I am going to shut down this server. And I, wanted to I wanna shut it down just to show you something. All right, so we're shutting that server down. All right, so let's go back to machine one over here while that's shutting down. And this is just to save time because it takes a little while for some of these things, for some of these items to take place. Shutting down, it takes a little while. So we have our machine two over here. One of the issues I was running into is I didn't have enough storage on my C drive when I created my machine. So I needed more space. So what I, in order to do that, one of the things that took me a little while to figure out is our machine right here, you have a disk option. And I left the machine up and running because I wanted to show you something just intentionally. But we can go here and we can say, okay, I want to add, I've already got 261 allocated. Let's add 265 gig to this server. We should get an error, and that error is because disk resizing is only allowed when the server is in a stopped or a deallocated state. Also, something I want to point out is once you increase this size here, you can't go back in time. You can't decrease it. It's not a supported operation. So if you are going to increase your OS drive, make sure that you're, you're, it's prudent, and we'll talk about that here in a second, or the size is what you really need. It's right size to your environment. Gonna click X out of there. Let's go back over to our virtual machines and see if we are stopped. We are stopped. Okay. So one thing I want to point out here is you can see here that the machine is in a stop state. We are still being charged for um, uh, compute resources, and we'll talk about that here in a second. What I want to do is I'm going to go over here to the portal. And I'm going to hit stop. What the stop over here in the portal does is this puts our VM into a deallocated state. So once that is completed, and it, you can see here it's going through a deallocating stage. Well, that's deallocating. Let's connect to machine two real quick. All right, machine two.
All right, as we connect to machine two, and I will pull that up here. Another little thing that would get catch me off guard, and I, I, I used it, and it made sense after I looked at it for a while, and this is still connecting up. Um, one of the things that caught me off guard is you're going to see this D drive on, on your server. And this D drive is labeled C colon temp. You're going to see, or D colon, I'm sorry. And you're going to see here that a little bit of space is used. But it's called temporary storage. It's going to show nothing here. What, what the server is using this for is for the page file. Um, so that if you need more memory than what's available on the OS, if you're familiar with the page file, you'll know what I'm talking about. If not, um, it's it's the f essentially it's where memory items need to go if we run out of memory on the server in a nutshell. But here you're going to see that there's a data loss warning readme, and they put this here for a reason, um, because a lot of us were using this to store our data. So if you have temporary or data that doesn't need to be persisted, then you could then I would put it here. I wouldn't. Um, not use it but if you need data that needs to be persisted do not put it on this drive because next time your server stops and restarts anything that's on this drive is wiped so that is something to pay attention to so now that we're on machine one and it, there we go all right so now we're going to go back to our disks and we're going to say we want to increase our disk size to 265 gig we're going to save that, and that should update our virtual machine. We're going to exit out of here while that's happening. And then we're going to go back here to our virtual machines, and we're going to start this back up. We're going to start it back up here for a second. And um, so we mentioned another thing that was painful with Classic that, I, uh, that used to get me. Um, was the fact that you would have a machine, right? A virtual machine. However, we know this virtual machine has objects or resources associated with it. So if we go over here and we look at our resource groups, right here, this little box right here, our resource groups, we can see environment three. And associated with environment three are all these resources, our network security, our public IP, our network interface, our virtual machine, our disk, our virtual network, our storage account. Back in the classic model, we would have to know the order to remove these, and then we would need to remove each of these items independently. However, with resource groups, now what we can do is we can go over here and I can say delete, and I know we just spun up this environment three, but I'm gonna just delete it right away. I didn't need it after all. I can say delete. It's gonna ask us for our resource group name. That's just to make sure you're doing what you intend to do. So environment three is our resource group name. I'm gonna hit cut and or copy paste. I'm gonna type that in here. We'll get a little green check mark. And all of these associated resources with environment three will now be deleted. So it'll go through and delete those resources. So let's go back to our VMs while that's working, and we'll come back to that. That's going to take a little while to to uh, to um, delete all those resources. So we're going to go back to our VMs. We're going to go to machine one. Now that it's started, we're going to hit connect, and we're going to go down here. Where I'm sorry, we're going to hit connect. I did it twice. If I did it three times, that would have been the charm. All right. DBA Bulldog. You know, one time, um, it was funny. I was typing in my password, and um, the uh, folks on the line were like, do you know you're talking out loud with respect to your password? And I was like, oh, no, I didn't know that. Um, so I had to change my password. But that was pretty funny because I was saying it out loud. Because when I type, I talk sometimes, and that could be hazardous to our health, apparently. Um, so I've opened up machine one here, and what we're going to do 
is we're going to go here to the disk. And you're going to say, well, but Dan, I know you allocated additional space for this. Well, that is true, and it's just like a server. So we extended our C drive, but what we need to do is we need to go to Manage. We need to go to our local server. We go need to go to Computer Management. And I'm walking through the full path to get here. You can just open up Disk Management independently if you wanted. But we're going to go to Disk Management, and what I wanted to show is that you can see here that our space is still unallocated to the server, so we would just extend our C drive to the new unallocated space. Okay, so we're going to close out of this. And those are some of the little things that would trip me up constantly when I first started um, working with uh, Azure. So we've gone over our classic and our ARM model and some of the ways we deploy and some of the items that would kick me in the butt, for better choice of words. Um, so, oh my, my VM. So last month, I was testing some capabilities of Azure, or a couple months ago, and all of a sudden, my cost just went through the roof. And I mentioned earlier, I have $150 worth of spend per month. And I don't like getting close to that limit, but I was at $138, and I'll show you that here by mid-month, and I only have 14 days left and I knew I had a lot of work to do. So a couple things we can do to prevent overspend in our Azure environment. We can use the automatic shutdown to prevent spend and I'll show you where to do that. It's really easy to do and I recommend it for all dev test environments when you're setting up VMs. Um, I am stopped, deallocated, why is there still spend? Well, I had all my VMs shut down but one of the I items I learned late last year is that even though you're in a deallocated state, any of your spend on your server, for example, your IP, your uh, private IPs, any static IPs you've defined, your OS drive, any data drives, the data drives made sense to me, but the OS drive and the IPs didn't make sense to me, but I was still incurring spend on those. So even though you're in a deallocated state, it's just something to know that you're going to have spend on your VMs, even if they're in this deallocated state. Also, when you set up a, a VM gateway, even if your server isn't connected to your VPN through your gateway, you're still going to incur spend for that gateway. So there's little items that you need to 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 keep in mind, and we'll look at some of those, the cost of those items. Um, and we can use the resources to determine spend, and we'll look at that here in the portal. One of the things I want to show before, well, one of the things before we look at the resources to determine spend, is I want to show you this automatic uh, um, shutdown. So we're going to go back to our portal over here, um, and we have, let me close this. We have our machines. Let's go to our virtual machines. That's classic. All right. So we have our, let's go to machine one. Let's use machine one. Down here on our first blade, when we choose a machine, there's this item right here. And I don't have it set yet. But it's called auto shutdown. If I enable this, I can set up a specific date, time every day to shut down a VM. So if I am deploying a dev test VM and I know my developers go home, you know, eight, nine o'clock at night, um, I can schedule every night to shut down, have a scheduled shutdown of all those dev VMs. You could have that in your resource management template. And you can also send a notification to those users. So you can, so it wouldn't, you know, blindside them if they're working late because they can always stop the shut but it's just a neat little feature to reduce that spend now how can we um, yes okay so how can we look at how much a server is going to cost us well Microsoft has provided us with this little pricing calendar calcul calendar calculator here where we can price out our features. For example, I already have here in my window that I wanted to price out a two-core, seven gig of RAM with 100 gig of disks and at 
two dollar or uh, twenty eight cents an hour. So it'll give me my hourly spend for a month, or if I were to do seven forty four a month, it, I could break it down by days. So you can estimate your spend here now. You can add items if you know you're going to have networking, like I talked about, your IP addresses. Uh, if you know you're going to have databases, you can add those here. So Microsoft has provided us a way to estimate our spend. And when we, one of the questions we get often from management or from our team is, how much is this going to cost me? We can tell them, well, we can provide you a good estimate based on the right-sizing of our environment. Another thing we can do is when we're looking at our servers is we can go over here. So I talked about, well, real quick before we go with that, you can see here that machine three is gone. So if I go over to all my resources and I sort by my resource group, my environment shows that environment three was gone. It was that easy to just clean that environment and clean that spam from my Azure environment. Now, I talked about last month or this month, I was incurring a huge amount of spend. So one of the items Microsoft has provided us is down here on our screen, there's this little, looks like a little circle chart with um, items that, uh, you know, uh, color of the different types of spend that's going on. And it's called the billing blade. We can open up our billing blade and we can see here that it provides us information about our billing, our payment methods, our active su subscriptions, and it shows me I have two here. I'm interested in an active subscription enterprise edition. So we're going to click on here, and you can see here it gives a breakdown of all the spend I have over, the, over this current billing period. And a billing period isn't month to month. In my case, my billing period ends five days from now. Um, some your billing period could be the middle of the month. It's just dependent upon when you set up your Azure account. But we can go here and then we can drill in further and we can see all of our spend for our particular items. So you can see here that I was spending a lot of money and one of the items I mentioned was that I was um, deploying the gateway and you can see here that the standard gateway I was setting up VPN connections was costing approximately $61.18. It was, it was set to consume about $128 for the month for that particular item. So I had to stop running that service. So you can see here, Microsoft has provided us one way to look at um, our spend for our particular items. Another way, and this is where resource groups are awesome, is you can come up to your resource group here and we can say, okay, I want to look at, let's say I know environment one is, well, I don't know which environment's spending me all my, all of my Azure spend. I can go here to my resource cost and I can show how much this environment is spending for this particular billing period. And you can see here that the most expensive part of my account is my storage, even though my servers are deallocated, I'm still being charged for this storage. So those are some ways we can look at um, Azure spend through the portal. Now I found this, and this is inside the slide deck, but I found this cool little PowerShell here. Um, and what this PowerShell does is it dumps out to a file, and I found this out on GitHub once again. Thank you, GitHub. Um, open up our PowerShell. I'm going to power, paste it here in my ISE. Uh, I'm going to log in real quick. Oh, geez. This is, uh, this is my Azure account here that I need to log in with. I apologize. Too many accounts. All right, it's going to redirect me. Type in the password. All right. Type in our password, and that's going to dump out from my enterprise 
and here it's going to pop up this little PowerShell which enterprise which subscription I want to look at I just want to look at my enterprise edition and this is going to dump out to an Excel spreadsheet so what we can do with this let me open up the spreadsheet from my temp drive and open this up and what this does is it dumps out um, our usage start and end date the units what we've consumed our project so just wanted to show that you can do it you can look at your Azure resources and your spend through multiple uh, ways either through the portal or through PowerShell with the rest API and I have provided a link inside the slide deck you can also monitor uh, using these resources here through uh, PowerShell and alert your team if you're getting to a particular spend point. All right, so those are some of the issues I've run in with my VMs. Now, another thing is we need to know our limits, right? There are resource limits, and they do exist within Azure, and the list is long. However, there is a way for us to request more. So within, for example, within my account, my Azure account, I have 20 cores. I can put in a request to add more cores. So let's take a quick look at, at um, this list, and I'm going to pull it up here. I didn't put it in here because, the li like I said, the list is long and proud. So let's take a look here at the list will open up a window here and this link is provided in there as well but we're, I'm just going to scroll through here really quick but these are the all the resources within Azure that has a limit the ones you know I'm interested in is cores per subscription the default is 20 the maximum is 10,000 I'm working with a client who is rolling out close to a hundred um, Azure VMs for a compute environment, so we had to obviously increase our default limit. Our DS, the, our SQL Server databases per subscription, that's an important one to remember. Our storage accounts, um, and you can see here, like I said, the number of VMs per script per subscription, we had increase, and there's a way to do that. So if we needed to, we would go over here on the right hand side of our screen. And we would, there's this little key, right? And that's our subscription. So if we click on this key, it's our subscription. I'm going to click on the Visual Studio Enterprise. This is going to tell me, you know, once again, my cost. And, and uh, it's going to give me some analysis. But up here, I'm going to go to this Manage tab. I'm going to hit Manage. And it's going to open that up. It takes a little while because it's pulling information from my subscription account. Okay. Well, that's going. So we'll come back to that here in a second. So we'll know we're, we're going to increase our limits. But so now that we know these little nuances, these little things that can bite us in the butt from an Azure perspective, what are our next steps? So. My next steps, and I, I suggest that a lot of our next steps are we get a better we can so our we can get this better define and cost out our environment. So now we can write automated reports. So we can look into the ARM. We can also look into ARM templates for automation to have those consistent and easily deployable environments. We can start discussions with our teams. We can say, look, I know my estimated cost of my environment is going to be this it's an estimated cost but this is a good starting point for us and we can also ensure management that we're going to control our dev test environments by using features like the automatic shutdown or using a PowerShell script to to automatically shut down so let's see if this all right great it came back so now here this is in at my account window so this is managing my account so a couple things I want to point out is I'm down to five dollars and eighty cents. Good, we're going to make it. Um, if I wanted to, if I exceed my hundred and 
$50, I can click on here and I can remove my spending account for this month. So yes, I want to remove my spending account and I can remove it for just this month. And if, as long as you have a credit card on file and they'll, they'll take the credit card as long as it's a valid one, I can spend for this month. And then for next month, I can easily remove that. So I'm back to my $150 spend. So we can control our spending limit. Also here, we wanted to um, request additional additional um, resources so we can go here and they moved it on me of course they did um, oh so inside here we could choose and I can't find it right at the minute and I apologize but um, we can we can come in here and we could and i'm just missing it right now but there is a link in here and maybe that's a good blog post and i'm i'm going over and that's probably why i'm missing it but there is a link in here where we can go and we can request additional resources for our environment uh let's let's click here on manage payment no okay so there is supposed to be a link in here that I can add uh, additional cores and it would be through this uh, account windows azure.com right now it's just eluding me <laughs> and um, I do apologize for that. So we have our next steps now. Um, go back and set up your private uh, account or, or through a Hotmail account or something like that and start playing with Azure. Azure is awesome. It, it's I'm seeing more and more adoption. Pragmatic Works is seeing more and more adoption. Um, we do these things called fast starts uh, where we'll come out to the company for three to four days um, and it can be dedicated to Azure, SQL DB, Power BI, uh, SQL DW. So we do all these little fast starts that we, we can come in and assist you with that. So that is it. That is the presentation for today, today's webinar. And um, look for a follow-up blog post. I will make a note of this because I really want to show where you can go in and ask for additional resources. It's just eluding me right at this time. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Dan. Um, and thanks again, everyone, for joining our webinar today on Azure. We will be sending you a recording of today's presentation via email tomorrow. I know we always get a lot of people asking about, um, you know, how they can access this information. So you'll be able to reaccess that again. Um, and if you have any questions regarding today's webinar, please feel free to email me. Uh, my name is Erica, and uh, you can email me at etotten at pragmaticworks.com. Let me go ahead and spell that out for you guys. It's e T O T T E N at pragmaticworks.com. And feel free to join us every Tuesday for our free webinars. Thanks, guys.